I stand before you today as neuroscience is crawling its way out of its infancy and sort of standing unsteadily in its cranky toddler period. It's been thousands of years in the crib, so it's about time. You see, neuroscience in some form or another has kind of been around for as long as there have been humans. About five to 10% of our earliest ancestors' skulls feature giant holes missing from them indicating that they were kind of taking a shot at brain surgery, the oldest form of surgery that we know about. Now, they may, might have been trying to heal some war wounds, let out the demons, bring people back to life. We could only really speculate as to what their purposes were. But the good news is that many of these skulls show signs of healing, recuperation, indicating that many of our earliest ancestors survived our extremely literal first stab at neuroscience. <laughs> but the bad news is that we really didn't do a whole lot better than that for most of human history. I mean, the tools just really weren't there. Um, we could take the brain and we could look at it, uh, see kind of how it was shaped, observe that it was squishy, uh, see what happens when giant chunks of it were missing. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of it. Uh, we really didn't get the first really useful modern brain sensors until, very, until early in the 20th century and even then, they didn't really come into their own until the advent of digital computing uh, about half a century later. But now we're really on fire. I mean, we are discovering brain sensors, brain stimulators faster than we know what to do with them. We have more data than we can analyze. But given all of this stuff, it's really exciting time for us. But neuroscience still has one central problem. You only have one brain. If we break your brain, we break you and you go crazy or die. <laughs> Bad news. What's more, your brain kind of has its own agenda. It kind of fights back whenever we try to do stuff for, to it, for good or for bad. I got inspired to get into neuroscience back as an undergraduate at the University of Central Florida uh, under a man named Dr. Richard Gilson. Uh, Dr. R Richard Gilson is a brilliant man, very inspiring, and he has Parkinson's disease. Now, for those of you who don't know, Parkinson's disease is a neurological disorder that affects your motor systems makes it so that you're afflicted with tremors that make it extremely difficult to go about your daily life. Now, I got excited because Dr. Gilson has an actual brain implant that helps him treat this stuff. This brain implant is inserted deep into his brain and emits electrical pulses that cancel out the tremors before they occur, allowing him to lead a more or less normal life. That is cool. But the problem is, like I said, his brain has its own agenda, and his brain is treating this implant like a gigantic splinter, it's saying, get out of me, it's attacking it scabbing it up, making it worse, doing its absolute best to destroy it. And that's bad. So what do we do given this stuff? How do we study and repair the vitalist of the vital organs that has an agenda of its own? That's pretty simple, actually. All you have to do is just build another brain. How do you build another brain? Actually, the same way you build anything else, pretty much. You start with the smallest parts, and you build up from there as best you can. Now, in the case of the brain, the smallest part that we kind of have, that we have our grasp on, is a special kind of cell called a neuron. It's a cell that's absolutely specialized in sending signals and connecting with other neurons. In your little one-by-one -one box of bone, you got about 80 to 100 billion neurons. It's a billion with a B. And like I said, they're specialized in communicating and connecting. Uh, they, form, they communicate across connections that are called synapses. And you have about 100 billion of these in your brain. That's you in your brain have more connections then there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That's an awful lot. So the brain is insanely complex. But the good news for us today is that neurons do the same thing that they do. They do their neuron thing, whether they're inside of the brain or whether they're outside of the brain. You can grow neurons outside of the brain, and they will still send signals and connect with one another. I mean, you have to be nice to them. You have, <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep them fed. You've got to keep them clean. Don't sneeze on them. All the, all the usual things that you would do for uh, taking care of humans. And so then you can have this special setup which we call in vitro neuroscience. In vitro is Latin for in glass, um, usually referring to the flasks, the test tubes, the petri dishes that you see people using in all these science videos. And this is really cool. It gives us an opportunity to study uh, neurons on a level that you absolutely cannot do whenever they're in your brain and are doing vitally important things for you. But it's not just glass, it's not just in vitro. There's a lot of metal that's involved here too. Uh, remember how I mentioned that 
it's not good whenever you try to insert something into the brain because your body treats it like a giant splinter. Well, what if we grew neurons right on the sensors themselves? You can grow them on these little things called microelectrode arrays made out of metal, which can then sense the electrical signals and even deliver electrical signals back. And they can plug that into a computer. You can analyze the signals with a computer, and you can even send signals with a computer. You can grow a brain on a chip. And this gives us an awful lot of advantages whenever we're doing neuroscience. For one thing, like I said, we break your brain, we break you. We break a brain on a chip, whoops, we just throw it out, build another one. Build 12, it's wonderful. So this is great for us because if you get sick, we can either test one treatment at a time on you and hope it doesn't drive you insane or kill you, or we can test 12 drugs at a time on these little chip brains on a chip, and if we mess one up, that's okay. We'll just build a couple other ones. This also gives us an advantage because we are going to be able to make brains on a chip out, out of not just any neurons, but out of yours. And this is really cool. You see, if we do animal testing, uh, we've made a lot of great strides with this, but animals are far enough away from us that their results don't always necessarily generalize. They're close enough to us to feel pain and do, do other things that force us to kind of walk an ethical tightrope whenever we work with them. But if we're able to work with your cells, with your genes, your history, your weird new problems, then we're going to be able to discover ways of treating things that are going to be part particularized for you, personalized for you. We're entering a few, uh, an era of what we can call personalized medicine, where we're going to be giving you treatments that are working not just on animals, not just on humans in general, but are tailor-made just for you. Now, I did mention that we've moved the, beyond the whole punching holes in our skulls and hoping we get better thing. So how do we get your neurons without punching a hole in your skull and hoping you get better? Um, the way that we do this is through uh, technology that is going to be a big word, but it's an important word. Uh, it's called induced pluripotent stem cells. Induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, it sounds like a lot, but if you work backwards, it's pretty simple. Stem cells, a uh, big hot topic in bioethics, are cells that can be converted into other kinds of cells. And pluripotent stem cells are stem cells that can be turned into uh, almost anything. Like it should be turned into a heart, into a brain, into a liver, into skin, you name it. Almost everything except for a whole complete new organism. And induced pluripotent stem cells are stem cells that have been made that way, where we take cells from you, normal, healthy, fully developed cells, chemically treat them to turn them back into stem cells with your DNA. And then we can turn that into whatever we want. We can turn that into brain stuff, heart stuff, liver stuff, whatever stuff. So it's not just a brain on a chip that I'm here to tell you about today. I mean, you could tell you today about a heart on a chip, or about a liver on a chip, about skin on a chip, about an entire integrated body on a chip that has your genes, your history, your new problems, etc. This is what's going to happen when you go to the doctor in the future. Take a, take a biopsy, turn that into a system, and we'll create a, a tailor-made solution just for you, based, based on whatever's going on with you. So this is personalized medicine, and it is amazing. It is exciting, and it's not quite enough. You see, if you do everything right, if you eat well, drink lots of water, sleep great at night, exercise, do exactly what the doctor orders, you're going to die, eventually. This happens to all of us. This is one of the few things that each and every human has in common. But before that happens, you're also gonna decay. This is another thing that's gonna happen even if you do everything right. And this is where the real scariness is for me. Because your body falls apart, your brain falls apart. Your brain falls apart, your mind falls apart too. So with your mind goes your memories, your wit, your relationships, a lifetime of experience is on the line here. But there's hope for me in this. Because, remember how I said that if you put something into your brain, your brain treats it like a splinter, does its absolute best to throw it away? What if we built an implant, not out of metal, but out of more of your brain? What if we were able to build a graft con constructed out of your cells with your genes that your body would recognize as its own? Now we've made some initial progress with this. We've, been we've made some initial progress with this in studying it in peripheral nervous system, the system that's out here in your arms and your legs, treating disorders such as ALS. And eventually, my hope is that this is going to move into the central nervous system. So we'll see. But the body, body on a chip stuff is excellent. I do this every day at the Hickman Hybrid Systems Lab at UCF. 
we're working to take things from, pers develop a system of personalized medicine. And my hope is that we'll be able to turn this personalized medicine into regenerative medicine too. And my hope is that this technology will mature as we mature too, ensuring that all of us alive today can pack our life with as much experience, joy, and love as we possibly can. My hope for this is that th as this technology develops, it'll enable us to give our grandchildren's grandchildren a life that is better than those of us alive today could possibly imagine.